people are willing to spend, you know, $2,750, $3,200, $3,500 rent. In rent. They have no idea what their landlord's interest rate is because they don't need to know. They're just making the payment and they're okay doing that. Hey everybody, Steve Moon here. So excited. We've got Janine Vienendahl here on the podcast. She is a absolute rock star in the mortgage space in Canada. Uh, she's a mortgage broker with real approved mortgages uh, in Sarnia, Ontario. She covers all of Ontario. She's an, she's a beast and uh, just want to talk a little bit about your yeah, beast in the most positive way of crushing business. And uh, I want to just kind of chat a little bit about, uh, you know, what it's been like. The The market's certainly been an up and down, absolute roller coaster, uh, you know, between the stuff that had happened with all the lockdowns and the spike in the market and then the shift that happened uh, recently. So did you tell me just a little bit about yourself, uh, introduce yourself to the listeners. Well, hello, Steve. Thank you for having me. Uh, I am a mortgage broker, was previously a mortgage agent for a couple years. Uh, before that, I had some accounting experience, serving experience, loved money and loved to be social. So here I am, mortgage it's, it, broker. It, it's a really good pivot then, that's for sure. Really you, good uh, pivot, right? How do you blend those two careers, right? It's <laughs> the best blend and it works. So Exactly. Well, if, you're gonna, if you love money, market? have an unlimited surplus of inventory to sell. And that's you know the greatest what? thing about the mortgage about serving, like bartending, like you come home with that cash on hand, right? You, if you work hard, you give good service, you're going to make good tips. It's the same thing in the mortgage industry. The exact you know, same thing. That's actually really true. It's actually, right? It's, and, it's probably and the it's same in a lot of think, businesses. Yeah. And it's crazy to think that that style of job when you're younger or older, whatever you're doing it, could pivot to help you in this sort of career. Absolutely. I, I think I think anybody who is looking for somebody who's going to be a great employee, check out the service space. You know, because 100%. there's so many there's so many people. They work long hours. Uh, you know, they they deal with clients in very you know sometimes difficult situations. Yeah, uh, and they're great at just having a good time with people. And I think what a wonderful spot to recruit people out of is is the the service industry. Honestly. I'm going to say a good chunk of my friends are successful, very successful in sales. And they started waiting tables, you know, or bartending, or you're dealing with all kinds of people every Absolutely. day. Nice, Absolutely. Nice, mean, cheap, you know, rich, whatever <laughs> they might be. And the mortgage world's the same. Yeah. yeah. Right? I remember I had one uh, table once when I was waiting. They had, um, they ordered their soup. And they ate the whole soup. And at the end of it, they said, well, I don't want to pay for it. And because it was cold. I'm like, okay, great. You, you, you ate the soup. That's fine. We'll, we'll work yeah. on this. And then the salad came out. And then they said, well, there was bugs in the salad. But they ate the whole salad. I'm like, I think you really like bugs or something's not making sense anymore. But and like, let's just pivot that to a home transaction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, How many right. times has someone gone infirm and then instantly has some sort of remorse or wants to get yeah. out of it? And it's like, you already went in. You're in. You ate it. The you, food's in done. your belly, the right? Like, eaten. you have to close on this. So, yep. it's well, that it goes, goes down to, I think, you know, it's it's the good advice up front. And it's the good 100%. questions up front. If I, would have, if I would have said to the person up front, hey, is your soup okay? <laughs> There's no backing out, right? You like, would you've have already honestly, told me it's probably good. said. Shit. <laughs> yeah, it would have been way better at the front to say that than at the end, and then now now we've got a problem. And yeah. then having to tackle them in the in the parking lot to come pay their bills oh, it was crazy. Oh my goodness. You know what? But then you have the other great experiences, and it's the same with clients, right? You have people yep. who appreciate the service and they leave a good tip or they leave a good review. Like I find reviews are worth more sometimes. You know, just bringing more people in the door, and yep. same with mortgages, right? If you do oh, a good absolutely. job, the word gets passed on. No, what you were, you started off, what was the job before you were in the mortgage space? Like just right before you got into the mortgage space? Well, mom and stay at home, mom doing a daycare, had to run a business of some sort while I was at home. Couldn't, couldn't do nothing. Right. Yeah. That's just, uh, my work ethic, you know? So ran yeah. a little daycare out of my house, had too many kids some days and we had fun. It was a good way to make some money <laughs> while I was at home. And then That's what made you, one. what made you go, you know, I'm changing diapers. I'm looking after kids. 
<laughs> I think I'm going to look at pay stubs and like do mortgages. Like what, what was the TSN turning point on that? What made you look at that market? In, because there's so many markets to look into. Um, I do remember a friend recommending it and I do, you know what? It's so weird. I remember, I think it was grade 11. We did a chapter on, and, and a small chapter because schools do not touch on the topics of everyday finances enough, but we learned about mortgages and we learned about, I'm trying to think what else we were doing budgeting and just kind of like some simple or math in class. And I remember acing that section and being like, I love this, this math. I love it. Right. I just love <laughs> numbers in that way. So that's what I thought the accounting would fit for me. I started to pivot over to that chapter and thought, okay, maybe this is what I want to do. It wasn't because my brain just needs a little bit of creativity and the accounting yeah. just didn't give it to me. I need the social, you know, I need the events. I need the conversations every day. So a good friend of mine was like, why don't you try mortgages? And even my mom, why don't you try doing mortgages? You yeah. know, they pivoted yeah. me to the bank at first, but I knew I wanted to be independent. I wanted to own the business and work hard at it. If I wanted to, I didn't want to be nine to five. So yeah. That's awesome. What about you, Steve? What made you get into mortgages? <laughs> well, that is a very long story, but today's not about me. It's about you. And right, so, so yeah, the, well, that's, a, that's actually a really great story because, you know, you were, you were working with families, really looking after one of their biggest assets, which is their children. And now you're yeah. working with families looking after their other biggest asset, which is their real estate. And honestly, the, the feeling of both, like, I remember some days you really felt the strain of, oh my gosh, like these people are trusting me with their pride and joy, right? And that that pressure, you don't think that daycare providers would feel that? It is a very intense pressure. Yeah, and I can see that. same thing with the home transaction. An offer gets accepted, you know, your mortgage agent is thinking in the back of their head, like they're confident, but they're also thinking like, I got to get these people this out, right? Like we, we can lose sleep over it if we really want to, because in the end, like it's a lot of pressure. You don't get that house if things don't work out. So it's important to have somebody good on your side. Well, you know, it, it, the funny thing is, is and that goes down to, you know, the whole process of real estate. And I think, yeah. you know, when we were going through the height of the real estate market, uh, you know, through the, you know, when uh, we went through that big, bump that happened where, you know, real estate agents would be going out, throwing out 40, 50 offers and losing all these offers and, and finally getting the client to buy, you know, get that property. They're just, you know, just happy that they got anything. Yeah. And now pivoting that the sellers now are in that predicament of, you know, there's, there's less showings per, per house. You know, the idea of, you know, multiple offers is faded for, for many different areas. Um, you know, it, and then the financing and the people are getting the sticker shock of what does that look like now? Um, mm -hmm. Where where are you seeing people win in this space? Like, what what are the big wins where where people are coming out going, man? I think I'm actually ahead right now by what I'm what I'm doing. As purchaser, you're asking either. Yeah, purchase. We'll start off purchaser. Sure. Honestly, a lot of the files that are coming across right now, they're a multi generational purchase. It's mm mom and dad helping out or mom and dad living. And I, and that was going to be one of my rants today. I wish more people open their eyes to it. And I want to get more people to open their eyes to it. The cost of long-term retirement living or long-term care living is absolutely absurd. Rent is high. So if you own a rental, great. If you're trying to rent as a retiree, OES and CPP don't cover that. No. They don't cover rent. You are not making enough. No. So, why not use the generational wealth together with your son or daughter or whoever it might be who has a salaried income, they have savings, and purchase something together? It's only going to come to the family in the end. It's all uh, it's all to share, right? As long as you get a good family structure. Like You know, it's it's one of those things where I mean I see a lot from, you know, European families where you have a multi-generational home. You see a lot from like um, Middle Eastern or Indian families that have a lot of multi-generational homes, mm -hmm. but that normalized Canadian family, it's, it's few and far between. I mean, my, my wife was fortunate when, uh, when she grew up, 
they her dad built a they had a farm up uh, near uh, uh, Owen Sound, mm-hmm. and her they they built a addition on the house for the 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 grandparents, right? Her grandparents, her parents' dad, yep. and and mom. So what they did is is they had a door between the two, so there was there was good you know good fences make good neighbors. Yeah. But what it meant is is that when the parents had to go out somewhere, if the grandparents agreed, they just opened that door. And now the kids can kind of, you know, you have built in, built in child care. Built in babysitter. I know that's another thing, right? Like, but also too, like, I love my mom and I don't want her to be our everyday babysitter. So like you said, having those closed doors, having those walls, you know, and I think that's a lot of the hesitation in the Canadian culture is people don't want their parents to be nannies. And I think that's where a lot of that comes into play. They don't know. They're kind of itching to get out of the house and move away to school. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't really come around to that point where you're like, wow, it'd actually be probably nice to live with mom and dad until, you know, you've had a family or you're a little bit more established and you realize the dishes aren't going to do themselves. And the the magic maid doesn't come around the house and life gets a little bit harder, right? Well, I think Um, think it goes um, down to having... What boggles my mind, Steve, is like people will move into a triplex, fourplex, and not know who's on the other side of the wall and trust that situation. So, yeah, you know, know. like when you think of it that way, it it definitely boggles my mind because you think about the, the idea of you could pick your neighbor. Now, Mm -hmm. you know, your neighbor isn't going to be, you know, doing dubious things, playing music to the wee hours of the morning. And if they do, it's probably because you guys are doing it together. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, and, and so it's, it's great, but it all comes down to setting up good, good boundaries. Yeah, I think, I think sure. most relationships uh, are about having really good boundaries. It's not about what mm-hmm. you, what you're, what you're going to do together. It's what you're going to accept that you're, uh, where the limits are going to be. Well, and I'm I think, sure with your kids, their ages, like you guys live in the same house, mm-hmm. but do you live in the same house together some days or is everybody scattered with the kids? Yeah. You know, it's interesting you ask that because, I mean, for us, we went from a very, I would say, you know, for us, it was a larger house. Yeah. And and we actually downsized because what we found is that because we had so much space, we were seeing yeah. our kids less. Yeah. And and so by them. creating <laughs> like in tighter, tighter walls, we actually yeah. see them more. Yeah. You know, and, and, and I kind of like that. Like, I'm not, I don't need to have, we used to build houses that were, you know, 20 to 55,000 square feet being a part of those builds. And mm-hmm. I don't think I'd but ever want to live saying, like though, Like with the multi-generation, if you are buying one of those larger homes, you're not going to be stepping on each other's toes. Yeah, that's right. Right? Yeah. Like, yep. yeah, it, it could be such a good solution if people would just accept well, it. Well, an interesting, you know? an interesting uh, setup right now is the city of Kitchener has just passed that um, uh, most residential if not all residential, and I haven't gone into too, no, too enough detail on this, but mm-hmm. uh, that they will allow in any of the residential zonings that you'd be able to build a fourplex. Right. Like, and so if you have parents home. and three kids, mm-hmm. now you have houses for everybody on a single pin. Yeah. And, and what a great thing. Like if, if you were thinking about trying to create a really great experience for a family, think about going to an amazing uh, resort, like say, I don't know, uh, Mont Blanc or uh, Mount St. Anne or, or, you know, any of these places, say uh, Whistler Blackhawk. The thing is, is what you're going to is you're going for the common elements. So if you created a living space where everybody had their own private living space, they gave them what they needed. Mm -hmm. And then you had a common element space, which had the pool, had the tennis court, had the basketball court, had the, I mean, you could have a pretty epic place. It doesn't have to be dingy. You no. can have a pretty epic place where you have all of these amazing things mm-hmm. and everybody has access to those amazing things, Yeah, you know, and, uh, you know, as they need it, cause you don't, you're not going to use the basketball court every day. No. And generally when you're going to play basketball, you're going to want somebody to be there to play with. So, you know, it's good to have that, that sense of community and what a wonderful way to build tighter family relationships. I know. And I think like, that. I hate even saying the word, but I think if COVID has taught us anything, is when I think about long-term care homes and I got, you know, I don't want to say anything bad about them, but you didn't know what was happening inside those walls when we weren't allowed to see 
our yeah. elderly family. Well, I and, mean, my, my wife did, she was a paramedic for 15 years and she saw them all yeah. the time. And well, and that's what I'm saying. Some of them like, are fantastic this, or some are the opposite of fantastic. Right. And I, and I get it though. Like their funding is low and they're scraping away, you know, trying to take care of these human beings. But if we have this situation where we have an accessible suite or we can put grandma or grandpa, you know, in the house and have a caregiver come in, yeah. like now you know that they're being cared for, they're being cared for properly. And, you know, you don't have to worry. Well, and right? there's so many great, like there's a, a really great service near us uh, that they come out to your house uh, you know, they provide all the services. I mean, one of the things is when they get older, you know, they might need bathing services. They might need, you know, all these other things. And, yeah. and we as children might not, uh, uh, you shouldn't want have to, to be that to your bathing parents. our parents. For a bit. Yeah, you can for a bit, but that's not, they don't want you to do it won't either. for a bit. I'm just saying, I, I, I probably won't. <laughs> but they don't but, want you to do it either. If you no, ask your mom and dad, they don't exactly. want to do it, you to do it either. Right? That's right. So exactly. Bring somebody in, bring a PSW in, have somebody come to the house regularly and, and yep. you can help with the other stuff that needs to be done. And they're going to help pay your mortgage. So, right. Like it's What's, a win -win. It's just huge teamwork. And I, I agree. I think that, that to me is probably one of the biggest things. I, I mean, one of the businesses that, uh, that I'm working with is a company that specializes in. So if somebody doesn't have that opportunity with family, what mm -hmm. they specialize is in creating cohabitation agreements so yeah. that, you know, and, and, and I look at this, I'm like, well, how did I buy my first house? Well, the way I bought my first house is I lived in one room and I rented out every one of the other rooms. Yeah. And then I traveled so much that I actually ended up renting out all the rooms. And when <laughs> I came home, I slept on the couch for the two days I was yeah. back in town. Couch surfed for a bit, and just then, so you kept the yeah. property. And it yeah. was great because I lived for free. But the thing is, I think if you go into the real estate market at any point and think, you know, my first house is going to be my last house, I think that's the thing that kills people the most we'll when they're trying to get into the real estate house. market. Get I in, know. just get in. Get something, yeah. have somebody else help pay your mortgage so that you don't have to bear the whole burden of it by yeah. renting out rooms or buying a duplex, buying a triplex, any of these things. And then you're going to get into a position of strength because that mortgage is just going to be paid down and paid down and paid down by somebody else, not mm -hmm. by you. I'd love to see a recent survey of you know the average time that someone spends in their first house right now. I think we might see it elongate a bit just given what the current market has done with the interest rates. Yep. But like I know us personally, we were just over four years and then we were ready to get out onto something else. It, we realized it didn't work for us and yep. on to the next one, right? But that house well, helped us buy the next house. We had the down payment available from our equity. That's you know, right. like it, that's the game. Well, exactly. I mean, a house is an asset. A house is a hedge against inflation. A house is so many different things. It's just a good pure storage of wealth. Yeah. Right? And I think, you know, are we going to see something as a pivot? I, I totally, we will. I mean, right. I mean, when we saw before, when interest rates were going down, it was very easy for somebody who had a house who wanted to sell it because their payout penalties would be low on their mortgage. Yeah. And, and the house is going up in so much value. Like they, they don't care about the payout penalties because they're just either making stupid money on when they sell yeah, them, they're, making they're paying stupid return. money and they buy. And it's just, they're just crazy numbers happening. Now what we're looking at is, is, is a stabilized market, which in my opinion, I love a stabilized market because it's predictable, it's reliable. You know, if you know that the houses are just ticking away, at, uh, you know, up at the inflation rate, mm -hmm. that to me is a beautiful market to be buying in. I love you know, that's where you can buy 10 properties and feel confident about yeah, doing it. I think rates around 5%. It's great. Yeah. And, and when you look at it and you say, okay, well, if, if, if that's the case and you're getting in that market, the only thing you have to be cautious about is if rates do start to drop, if you're in that five or 6% rate and the rates go down to 4%, is there are the, the payout penalty will be larger at that point. Yes. So it's something to think about. And that's why I think like a mortgage broker is really important to be involved in the cycle because I've seen when I, when I was in real estate and, and not in the mortgage space, you know, I would, I would go to start selling somebody's house and we're going through the whole process. They're all excited. And then, you know, you get that offer and then, you know, you start going through their financing and like, um, you know, your payout penalty is like, $40,000. It eats away your equity like crazy. Yeah. And then wow. all of a sudden they're scrambling because they, mm -hmm. they didn't realize that and they didn't get good financial advice. And 
And that's why I think the the I you know experience tells you these things. You got to make sometimes mistakes before, yeah, and or I have a really that. good mentor who helps you. Yeah, um, and like I think uh, our mortgage advisor at the time we were very young, we were nineteen, which is crazy to think, um, had advised us to go into a variable because I think right up front we had said, not sure how long we're really going to be here, just kind of want to buy a house, have a place, and at that time in their head they probably thought, okay, penalty and. How are we going to, you know, how, what's the cheapest way to get you out of this in the next couple of years? And yep. variables were a little bit more tame then as well, I think. We weren't seeing the climbs we have seen this past year, but yep. um, still was a risk. I'm not saying it's not. I just think that's where their mind pivoted to when they put us in that five-year product was they can yep. lock it at any time, but they can also get out with three months of interest. So, well, and you know, the thing is, is, is when we look at mortgages and we say five years, right? Like when people are assessing the market right now, I think we're starting to look at the real estate market, like stock market, yeah. where our, our barometer from, you know, measurement is weeks, months, not even year, maybe two it years is. at max. You nailed where it. You, you've got to be looking at real estate over a longer period of time. Yep. Like, for example, one of the things I do is I look at, okay, well, if we looked at real estate today and we looked at the interest rates of today and interest rates, fixed rates, as we know, are driven by bond yields. Mm -hmm. And we look at the bond yields of, say, uh, when were they at, at parity to where they are right now? And let's just say it's somewhere around 2007, right, is, is sort of give or take where it was at these rates. Well, um, would you, if you had the, if you had a Marty McFly flux capacitor, would you right now jump back? And if you could buy houses in 2007, would you do it? Yeah. I'd, I'd buy 10 of them. I'd buy right? 10 of them right now. Yeah. And because, you know, it was a situation where, you know, housing would tick up at three to 5% at, at inflation rates, yeah. you know? So, so this slight adjustment that has happened, you know, over the long term, I think it's, it's actually beneficial because houses will get back up to the same value. They're yeah. just going to tick up to the same and they'll exceed the value that they were because, yeah. I mean, money is arbitrary. Money is, money is a, a it's a fickle thing to measure with because it, it's, it doesn't have a fixed value. You oh, know, I most think. people, when they, most people, when they look at money, they look at money in the terms of a dollar is worth a dollar. Well, it's not, mm -hmm. you know, if you measured housing in the terms of lemons rather than housing in the terms of dollars, you would see that, that it hasn't adjusted that crazy compared to, you know, other, other, you know, assets or commodity classes. I think and, if you're looking for like really good advice as a first time buyer, ask the homeowners that have owned for the last 10 years, ask them, ask them what they bought their house for or their first house, ask them what they sold that house for. Like when asked what they made at that time listening. and how much was, right? how much if did they make at that time and how much was the cost of gas? Yeah. Like, and if you don't trust us professionals, you think that we're just trying to sell or, you know, there is a lot of stuff. You know, sometimes you just need to hear it, right? You need to hear it through a different pipeline to believe it. So yep. go to those sources and they will tell you. Like, you can probably say as a homeowner, Steve, certain timelines and scenarios of prices. Like, we bought, it's going to be hilarious, but we bought for 232, mm -hmm. 232, 232,000, and sold only for 250 in four years. That return, yep. not great. But that yep. was the timing of the market. And but how it, you, wait going. a second, say that one more time. You bought for how much? 232, 232,000 is sold for 250,000. So it was a weird, it's kind of where we are right now. It's kind of in that, you know. Yeah, after that, little, after that wash of, of, you exactly. know, expenses for transaction, it's, and expensive. that would have been in 2009. Yeah. So there it you is. You actually lost right money there. on that one. And when you factor in your, in, in, we in did. Benedict. And you yeah. know what? The realtor was up front off the get go and was like, this isn't going to be a great return, but I know this is the location you want, blah, 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 right? Yeah. Um, but then, our next house, we bought 282 uh, seven years ago, and it's now worth just under a million dollars. Well, and the thing is, is, is when you buy real estate, or so you sell real estate, and then you buy real estate, if you're transacting in the same market, yeah. you're not really, you're, yes, you're getting the transactional fees of the, you know, that's going to impact. Commission, yeah. You know, that, that's, that's one of the, the, the things you really have to the factor in. But if, if it washes out that you're just going to another maybe higher performing asset class, that's the same as like buying and selling a, a stock or exactly a mutual fund did. or whatever. We moved yeah. from more of a college industrial area to lakeside living Yep. for the same, you know, I like it just, and now you think about 
something. And that's only seven years. That was us having kids. And that's it. You know, like growing up a yeah. little bit and here we are and we know it's going to keep going up. Yep. Yeah. I, like I, I know for us, we bought, you know, 2005, we bought in 2006, we bought in 2000. When else did we buy? Oh, yeah, we bought so many. You also know you need to hold when like, 12. you know when you need to hold. I mean, we bought one and we, we flipped a house, you know, and, and we flipped two properties and, uh, one of them, I was kind of glad we flipped it. Uh, the other one, I wish we would have just kept it. Yeah. Um, you know, I think, I think for us, the biggest regret we have in real estate, uh, is the properties we didn't buy. hundred you know, percent. It, we don't have real estate regrets with the properties that we did buy, even when we bought them in the height of the market. You know, we had, we had two properties that we bought that closed, uh, you know, in the height of the market. Um, you know, we, you know, if, if you could say today, we could not sell them for the same price we bought them for, but mm -hmm. I'm not concerned because I know yeah. that, you know, they'll catch back up to that position in fairly short order. And, and I know that- And as long as you're earning an income too from them, right? Like you're earning- Well, that's exactly- And I'm not living in them. I, we're just yeah. parking money, right? So yeah. if I look at that and I think if I put it in, say, Tesla stock, Tesla stock, you know, just, you know, sometimes takes a beating and you think, oh, well, that's- Maybe I won't never buy Tesla stock again. Well, or maybe it just went through a beating. It's kind of like yeah. your relationship, right? Yeah. Your relationship with your spouse, your relationship with your spouse is going to be sometimes really, really good. Yeah. And then sometimes it's going to go through a really you rough time. It's a seven year itch. And, you know, it's just, yeah. you got to. <laughs> exactly. Gotta and then you got to figure out, hey, you know, yeah. does this mean that this relationship isn't good or does this just mean that I need to try to figure out how you to work a little bit harder, right? Exactly. Got to put the work in. No, it. I had a thought the other day. I was getting really, you know, sometimes the conversations about interest rates can really get to you. And as a professional, you try to guide people appropriately. You try to let them know it's okay. Yeah. And I just sat there and I thought people are willing to spend, you know, $2,750, 3500 $3, in rent. In rent. They have no idea what their landlord's interest rate is because they don't need to know. They're just making the payment. And they're okay doing that. If you, you could own a home and still make that payment that you're okay doing, yes, you're going to pay interest. But, like, you're going to own a home. <laughs> like, it's just, well, I guess. The thing is, is, the other thing is, is, is instead of even saying owning a home, you're going to have an asset. Right. And, and that's the hardest thing. A lot of people look at it as a, a home as a, a physical place that you occupy, yeah. but it, it is an asset that you're putting wealth into to store it. Right. And, sure. and so a great opportunity for a lot of people, especially like, you know, if you live in Toronto and you're still trying to buy in Toronto and Toronto is, you know, it, it's certainly not the cheapest real estate in the world. No. And, and so you might say, okay, well, maybe I don't have enough down payment or maybe I don't make enough to qualify. Then buy somewhere else and just get some storage of wealth in real estate so that you can buy a property. I mean, we've done this with so many people where we, you know, they'll buy, they live in Toronto, they'll buy in, say, Kitchener, they'll buy in like Barrie or they'll buy in London, Windsor, mm -hmm. wherever else they'll buy. And, and Over then they the have those properties somewhere. rented out. Yeah. And and that property's looking at as long as it's cash flow positive. Yep. You know, and you can still get cash flow positive, you know, properties today. I mean, you you look at at, at any uh, any real estate that you could buy right now. If you buy a property right now with say a mortgage of say you buy something, I think, you know, I in in Sarnia, you know, mm -hmm. I've seen houses in Sarnia around the value well, of You could buy five five for one <laughs> compared five to Five for one, yeah, exactly. <laughs> But but if you bought a house in Sarnia, of it. so why do you care that it's in Sarnia, right? That's exactly it. Because it, you're, it's like when you buy a stock, do you care where their head office is located? Not you at might all. maybe. Well, maybe I you mean, have. Yeah, if you're really into it, but yeah. Yeah, but well, you care. What's my return? Too is the pick. Like I don't want to say pickiness because love clients, love consumers, love everybody. But the the rate shopping is good. I think you should always shop, but sometimes. The hesitation still about going forward with the purchase because they don't want to take on a mortgage or they don't want to pay the interest. And I think to myself, if you've ever been in a situation where you can't get lent money or you say you got bad credit or just something, you're too, too fresh a credit. If you have a bank willing to give you hundreds of thousands of dollars of insured money for a rate of, let's say, five and a half to six percent. 
to buy a house, why aren't you running with your bags of cash to go buy that house? Like, why? Why does that? What is that faceless, nameless organization believe in you more than you believe in yourself? That is a big move for someone to loan you that money. Like, you should say yes and run and buy something with it and yeah, start investing with it. Like, it is very hard to get money lent at that interest rate. Like, you go to the Ford dealership. Nothing against Ford, but. You get your big F-150, rates maybe 8.99% interest over, you know, five years, seven years. You don't care about that. You're around driving, looking cool, you know, like what's your return on that? Yeah, that's right. Well, and that, that, cool. that to me is, I think that is, that is probably one of the biggest uh, concerns, I think, you know, the, with the, you know, people and way they spend their money is yeah. trying to figure out our, in, in, in everything you do, this is, this is, I think something that is just a life lesson in everything you do. Are you, are you spending or are you investing? Yeah. And are you consuming or are you creating? And if you could measure your life by those and say, okay, if you know, when I'm on the Instagram, right. Am I creating the or am I consuming? <laughs> On the Instagram. That's how, you like, that's how you sound old, right? When I'm on the Instagram. The Instagram. <laughs> and then, or when I'm at the store, am I investing or am I consuming, right? Yeah. And, and so that consuming element, and there's nothing wrong with consuming, but you have to know what is your ratio of, of where you're sitting. Yep. You know, and if you can operate within those bands of being responsible in the way that you spend your money and you're putting most of your money away into savings and investment, you know, when you buy a house and even if your mortgage payment right now is say, say your interest rates are say like, I don't know, say 6% and your mortgage is say $500,000 or something like that, your payment's going to be 3,200 bucks a month, which you're going to go gulp. That's that, that might be a big hit. But the thing is, yeah. 700 of that is just going to pay down the mortgage. So it's really only costing you $2,400. So it's really, if you look at the $700, the $700 component of that payment is forced savings. Yeah. And then if the, if, even if real estate never goes up, that forced savings means that at some point you can reclaim that back. Yeah. Now, if real estate starts to tick up in value, now you're getting a multiplier effect on that. So that's the thing that I think people need to do when they're looking at real estate is yeah. really take apart what is the true cost of my non-recoverable amount, which is mm -hmm. my interest or my property taxes, you know, the things that, that I have to have that are outside of paying it down, you know, and, and, and getting ahead. And that includes ma maintenance expenses. Yeah. Like you've got to look and say, what, over the next five years, what is going to cost to maintain this property? You know, it's going to in, in, in factor that into your cost, because if you do that, now you have a holistic value of what it is versus rent. Mm -hmm. well, I think, too, like I even had an old friend who's been in the banking industry for a while. And he said, I'm going to tell you one thing. He goes, you're still young. I'm going to tell you one thing. He's like, invest in real estate. I am kicking myself that I did not invest in real estate more because I yep. put all my savings, all my extra earnings into RESPs, RRSPs, stocks, bonds. You know, he said the whole thing. I had a whole huge investment portfolio. He goes, but I didn't own any real estate. And he goes, I am watching other friends in the industry and I'm looking at their portfolio and they started the same time I did. And he's like, I am kicking myself. Yeah. So he's like, any word of advice, invest in real estate. Doesn't matter when, just do it. Yeah, I think the idea, I think the term is, is and I, I think you make a really good distinction there, is don't buy real estate, invest in real estate. You know, and buy I think that's a, a house. Yeah. It's, you can it's, have an RESP, don't get me wrong, but buy a mutual yeah. house in Sarnia, you know, <laughs> 300000 Buy them each one. Yeah. Because it's not going to stay 300000 There's no way. Well, but the thing is, again, when we talk about that, it not staying at 300000 we have to, again, put in the mindset of money is not a, a stable investment measurement mm -hmm. because it, it has a transitory value. Like it's going to shift up in value, shift down in value. I mean, when the government goes out and prints off trillions of dollars, what does that do to the value of that dollar? Well, of course, it's going to drop the value of the dollar. Yeah. So the house isn't really going up in value. What's happening is, is the dollar is going down in value. Yes. So if you actually look at that, that's why housing is a good hedge. Because housing says, well, we're going to keep stable as a value. 
while the currency goes down in value. Because governments love printing money. They love printing money. <laughs> well, Janine, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you. We uh, really, truly appreciate your insight. And yeah. uh, what's the best way for people to reach you uh, so that they can uh, uh, get things going and get some really good sage advice around real estate and mortgages? Uh, well, you can reach me on the Real Approve webpage, or you can reach me on Instagram, Facebook, I'm not on the Twitter, need to get on there, uh, LinkedIn, or just simply by calling me. Beautiful. Well, Janine, thank you so much. And guys, we really appreciate you listening and hope you got some value about learning about, number one, getting into the mortgage business and, the, and how it can really truly make an impact in somebody's life, both yours and the people around you. And uh, some insight about the Canadian real estate market and that there is buying opportunities out there today. Uh, it is a buyer's market. So get out there and start shopping and... Uh, and, and start winning and start building up your real estate portfolio and, and building up your true wealth. So we'll catch you guys on the next one.